you've seen compact bone now under a microscope and so you know it has a very organized structure so we need to talk a little bit more about it remember the compact bone the structural unit of it is what's referred to as the osteon the osteon is also referred to as the the reversion system each osteon is a has a cylinder oriented pattern that runs parallel to the long axis of the bone so these osteons are really the tiny weight bearing pillars so they're very important pillars like what you see on your diagram here that is going to absorb a lot of a lot of force so we're seeing a exploded view here kind of a group of hollow tubes of the bone matrix itself and each matrix tube is called a lamella so it's the matrix tube itself and so for this reason we're also going to refer to compact bone as lamellar bone and there are collagen fibers in the particular lamina that run in a single direction but what's really interesting is there's going to be an alternating pattern here there's collagen fibers that are going to run in different directions and the reason that this is actually so important is it's going to withstand torsion forces and this makes sense if the collagen fibers are going to be going in the opposite direction and so we can kind of think of this design as allowing the lamellar bone to act like a tri twister resistor this would be a good name for a, um, a roller coaster I think at a theme park so let's look at some of the other anatomy of the osteon here we have the central canal the central canal is also going to be called the aversion canal um, or we can call it the osteonic canal but it's the very center of this twister resistor and it contains blood vessels as you can see here small capillaries and um, there's veins as well as different nerve fibers there's also going to be perpendicular tubes that run um, kind of at right angles to these to the long central canal and the these perpendicular tubes are called perforating canals or they are also referred to as Volkmann's canals and you'll see a lot of these in lab as well so you need to be sure that you're looking at the models and then there's also spider-like osteocytes which you saw in the previous mini lecture and these spider-like osteocytes are going to they're going to sort of occupy or live in little cavities that we refer to as lacunae or lacuna for singular and these canals themselves the canals are going to be little hair like canals that are going to connect the lacunae to each each other and to the central canal as well and the way that these canaliculi are formed are, is pretty interesting when the bone is forming the osteoblaster is going to secrete bone matrix that surrounds the blood vessel maintains contact with one another and then the osteocytes are going to kind of project out these spider extensions um, into these canaliculi so the canaliculi are filled with with tissue fluid and this tissue fluid is um, it contains the osteocytes extensions so the canaliculi really tie all the osteocytes um, in a mature osteon together so you can kind of think of them as canals for communication so our next slide here is showing some other parts of the compact bone and first of all we see different types of lamellae we see um, interstitial lamellae and these are lamellae that are, are located kind of in, in between the osteons and they are incomplete lamellae but the word interstitial really means between so they're between the lamellae themselves 
And then there's also circumferential lamellae. And the circumferential lamellae are going to be just within the periosteum. So they're going to be located more on the perimeter of the compact bone itself. And they're going to extend around the entire circumference of the diathesis. We're also going to see spongy bone. Remember, spongy bone is also called trabecular bone. It looks a little more poorly organized. But what's interesting about this is that the trabeculae, they are going to be aligned along lines of stress. And this is very important if you think about the, one of the major functions of the bone is to resist stress. And so these kind of act like tiny struts that are carefully positioned, sort of like the cables would be on a suspension bridge. Other parts of this diagram that we see here, um, you can see in the spongy bone, again, that there is no osteons present. So again, the osteons are going to be an important part of the compact bone. We see the central or the haversian canal. It can also again be called the osteonic um, canal. We see the perforating or the Volkmann's canal. So very similar structures that you, you saw on the previous slide. Our next slide is um, showing the trabeculae, which I've already mentioned. Again, there's no osteons. Uh, this structure sort of looks like a honeycomb Again, it's very, very poorly organized, certainly not as organized as compact bone. And so it still contains a lot of the same structures like a lamellae, oops, lamella, the osteocyte, and the caniculi, caniculi, they're just not nearly as absorbed as in the compact bone. So the organic um, and the inorganic composition of bone, the chemical composition of bone, is going to include the organic, which is really the living material. So this is what's going to contain the cells. And then the inorganic would be the non-living material. And the organic is going to include the cells as well as the osteoid produced by the cells. And then the inorganic is going to include the mineral salts. So let's take a closer look at the organic compound, the organic component of, of bone. We have the stem cells, the osteogenic cells. We have the osteoblasts, which are the bone forming cells. We have the mature cells, which are the osteocytes. And we have the bone destroying cells which are the osteoclasts. And the osteoid then that would be produced is going to make up about a third of the matrix, the extracellular matrix. It's going to include the ground substance, uh, things like proteins, proteoglycans, glycoproteins, as well as collagen fibers. So again, the collagen fibers um, as well as the ground sub substance, are both going to be made and produced by the osteoblasts. So the bone res resilience, the ability of it to be compressed and, and really absorb stress, is due to the, the bonds between the collagen molecules itself. Now the inorganic component, the inorganic component is going to be a very large amount, 65% of the bone mass. And it's made of what are called hydroxyapatites, um, which are the mineral salts. And these mineral salts are the calcium as well as the phosphate crystals. And um, they're found in the extracellular matrix. And these crystals are really what is responsible for the hardness and the resistance to compression. So it's very important that there's a combination of organic and inorganic matrix elements so that the bone can be very durable and very strong without being brittle. And it's the, de the decrease in some of these elements over time as we age which is going to account for 
the um, certain diseases like osteoporosis for example. Now bone development is called ossification or osteogenesis so these are really synonyms and um, in embryos this process is going to lead to the formation of a bony skeleton so this is going to be occurring in embryonic development and later another form of ossification is going to begin as well this bone growth is referred to as postnatal growth so it's what occurs until early adulthood as the body increases in size and then bones are also then capable of ossification all throughout life and this is going to be the bone remodeling and the bone repair so bone repair would be what would occur after a break or a fracture for example the word fracture really just means break it also is going to be the natural process of remodeling so this is what always is occurring and these are the main areas that we're going to be talking about kind of throughout the rest of the chapter these stages so when we think of the the stages um, we're going to specifically start talking about the first stage which is the bone formation that begins in the second month of development embryonic development and before week eight the skeleton of the human embryo is going to be constructed entirely from a fibrous membrane and from hyaline cartilage and from the fibrous membrane this type of bone formation ossification is referred to as intramembranous ossification and the bone develops from a fibrous membrane in this case this would be the flat bones things like the skull bones which are the cranial bones referring to the clavicle as well will form this way and um, you need to be able to kind of compare and contrast these two types of ossification in endochondral ossification this is going to form when cartilage uh, forms or when the bone itself is going to form by replacing hyaline cartilage and this is going to be for the rest of the skeleton that forms this way so everything except what is in number one so our next slide now is showing the events of intramembranous ossification. And you have this figure in your book. Your book first starts talking about the endochondral ossification, but we're going to start with the intramembranous ossification uh, first. It's kind of the more uh, simple example compared to endochondral ossification. And so, again, it would be for the flat bones, so for cranial bones, so things like the frontal bone, the parietal bone, the temporal bone, and the occipital bone, to name a few. And what's going to happen in this case is ossification begins when there's a fibrous connective tissue membrane formed by mesenchymal cells. The mesenchymal cells are kind of the non-differentiated cells. And what happens is they start to cluster into an area which is going to be called the ossification center, the center of bone growth. And we first see that forming. So there's um, centrally located mesenchymal cells that cluster. They differentiate into bone forming cells, which are the osteoblasts and there's going to be the first production of trabeculae that are actually formed in the first step and then the second step is going to be the osteoid secreted so we see osteoid which is again the um, part of the matrix and it's secreted within the fibrous membrane um, and calcification is going to occur in a few days and the trapped osteoblasts are now in this area and they develop into the mature cells 
which are called the osteocytes. And we start to see this organization pattern here where the osteocyte sort of reaches out its extensions into these canals called the canaliculi. Then the third step is shown here where there is now woven bone that's starting to form. And this woven bone, this network, uh, this would be really where the uh, trabeculae are going to be located. And um, so instead of the concentric lamellae, we have the trabeculae that are formed called the woven bone. There's now going to be a blood supply. So there is uh, some vascularization. So vac vascularized mesenchyme we see. And then the final step is going to be the lamellar bone, which actually is going to replace the trabecular bone, the woven bone. And that's just deep to the periosteum. So in the very center, we have the diploid, which is the trabecular bone. But we also have the lamellar bone, which is going to be located directly on the outside. So remember the organization of these flat bones is there is compact bone and there is spongy bone which is sort of sandwiched in between the compact bone. So the next type of ossification that's going to form and you have an A&P a, a Flicks video in Mastering A&P that you should take a look at that goes through this but endochondral ossification is going to be really much more prevalent so it's much more common then intramembranous ossification. And beginning late in the second month of develop is when this begins. There's a process where the hyaline cartilage bones, if you will, that are formed earlier as models are then going to be replaced by bone. And in this case, there are two ossification centers. So two centers of bone growth. So again, be able to compare and contrast, know the differences. The intramembranous ossification only has one ossification center. So the first thing that happens here is that there is a bone collar model that is formed around the diaphysis of the hyaline cartilage model. So the osteoblasts of the newly converted periosteumers are going to secrete osteoid against the hyaline cartilage diaphysis and there is a bone collar that is formed. In intramembranous ossification, the bone collar kind of forms at the very end. The next step is that the cartilage in the center of the diaphysis begins to calcify, and then it develops a cavity. So the cavity is going to be eventually where the medullary cavity is going to be located. Then the third step is where we have a blood supply that's being introduced. And the blood supply in this case is going to um, invade the internal cavities and spongy bone is going to start to form. So we have the periosteal bud here. This is going to be what eventually becomes uh, the nutrient foramina where the blood, blood supply enters. And so there is cavitation that is formed. There is the formation of this internal medullary cavity. The fourth step is elongation of the diaphysis, uh, which is, remembers the shaft of the bone. And the osteoclasts are going to be breaking down the newly formed spongy bone and opening up this medullary cavity. So you can see it, the medullary cavity is fully formed at this point. We're getting close there to being fully formed. And the ossification cartilage is um, forming along the length of the shaft as the cartilage calcifies, erodes on the epiphyseal um, surface. Then the second ossification center is going to form, and this is going to be in the epiphyses. So there is the proximal epiphysis, and there's also the distal epiphysis. And this um, is going to be, again, where the site for hematopoiesis Will actually happen. On the epiphyseal surfaces we have articular cartilage which is hyaline cartilage in the joints area 
and from childhood to adolescence so during really postnatal growth we're going to see the development of the growth plate here which is the epiphyseal plate cartilage and this epiphyseal plate cartilage then is going to continue to actually um, um, ossify and there are several different growth regions that you need to be aware of specifically in the growth plate so in here as well as pointing to this area also so just to review interstitial growth is increasing the length of bones so this growth is what is going to be occurring in the epiphyseal plate but appositional growth is increasing the thickness and remodeling of all bones by osteoblasts and osteoclasts so this actually occurs at the periosteum and the end osteum surface so these are the two general types, and they're, they can be occurring um, in all, all types of bone growth. So bone remodeling, for example. Our next slide, then, is showing the different zones that you need to be, to be aware of in the epiphyseal plate. So again, the plate is going to become the line after the growth plate closes, so when we hit adulthood. And this uh, longitudinal growth is going to mimic many of the events of endochondral ossification um, but the cartilage is relatively inactive on the side of the epiphyseal plate facing the epiphysis and that region is called the resting zone or the quiescent zone and so the epiphyseal plate abutting the diaphysis is going to organize into a pattern um, and at this point the cells at the top facing the epiphysis are going to be referred to as the proliferation zone so the resting zone where nothing has happened is also called the quiescent zone and this is going to be facing the um, epiphysis not the diaphysis it's facing the epiphysis and the prolifer proliferation zone is the growth zone as well and these cells are going to be dividing very very quickly so you can see that mitosis is going to be occurring and what this does is it pushes the epiphysis away from the diaphysis and actually causes lengthening of the entire bone from occurring and then also, uh, there is a hypertrophic zone. Hypertrophic means um, there is enlargement that's occurring. We actually see that the lacunae, the lacunae are going to enlarge. So they erode and enlarge. So what this does is it leaves kind of larger interconnecting spaces. And so the surrounding cartilage matrix calcifies Chondrocyte, chondrocytes are going to die, deteriorate, and this is called the calcification zone. So you see calcified cartilage spicules that are found in this area. The next zone is the ossification zone, and this is where new bone is actually going to form. So we would see osseous tissue in this particular area, um, and these Calcified spicules ultimately become part of the ossification zone. Osteoclasts are going to erode the cartilage spicules. Osteoblasts are going to cover them. And spongy bone replaces them. So here we see down in this zone that spongy bone replaces the newly um, or, or the removed cartilage. And during this growth, the epiphyseal plate maintains a constant thickness because of this rate of cartilage growth on the epiphyseal side. But ultimately, uh, this longitudinal growth is going to be accompanied by some remodeling of the epiphyseal ends in proportion. And then remodeling involves new bone growth and then bone resorption. And that's what's going to happen all throughout our lifespan.